My name is JT Parr, and I'm traveling the country to interview geniuses and find out how the world works. After talking to Mike Jordan about the future of AI, I wanted to go even further into the cutting edge of technological innovation. That's why I decided to meet with Sean O'Kelly, a quantum computing researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Sean talked me through the science behind these incredible machines. Here's our conversation. So room temperature, 300 Kelvin, a lot of jiggling around, a lot of random stuff. We got to get cold to stay quantum, right? And so all our experiments are down in here. These little gold-plated cans are, uh, we can't even see the experiments because they're all inside these cans, but those are little magnetic shields. Down here we're at about 10 millikelvin. But this is the coldest but, thing in the universe. Yeah, in nature, there's nothing this cold in nature. Could you do a prank where Johnny Knoxville was like at the bottom of this? So let's get to basics. All right. What is a computer? Computer is a machine that will do uh, math or make decisions based on the instructions you give it ahead of time. And so that can be really, really simple. Like the simplest one I can think of is like a light switch. That's not even really a computer. It's so simple. It's like if I flip it up, I want it on. If I flip it off, I want it off. You can imagine uh, uh, some rooms have two light switches, right? Where like either light switch will flip the light. And so how does it know? Well, you can actually, that's kind of like a little computer. Now that could but be represented. But a light represented. switch isn't a computer. A uh, light switch has two positions, like one and zero. It's this, in this case, we're talking binary, right? You're right, you're right. It, it doesn't do very much, but it's still, it's kind of deciding, depending on these two inputs, that the lights on or off, and it's useful for us. This is one thing I really like about quantum computing, because rather than kind of forcing a machine to be a classical one, zero kind of discrete kind of thing, you actually use those quantum mechanical states as a computing resource. Like, hey, let's use nature such as it is and use that to make a computer instead of forcing nature into this idea of classical. I mean, I guess, so is quantum mechanics the idea that the more we learned about the atom, the more we realized we didn't actually know where the electron was. And then it came down to a concept of the electron was basically in two places at once. It's kind of like that before quantum mechanics if you look at physics, you want to describe the physical world, and you kind of look at stuff, and you and there's motion, and so light, you know, is is a is a wave, and everyone thought, okay, wave mechanics, everything you know about how waves work is how we describe light, and then there started to be these experiments that said, well, sometimes light shows up like with a big ping, like it's a discrete thing, a particle, and that didn't make any sense. And then later on, started to look at things like electrons, things that are like things you expect to be like a ping, uh, a, a chunk. And those seem to be like waves, which was kind of even harder to swallow. And so now quantum mechanics is kind of the math that we've used to describe the physics about matter and waves, where like waves are like things and things are like waves. And so our language isn't very good at describing it because it sounds like a contradiction, but nature's kind of both. I, you know what, you sent such a fire email to us <laughs> in the lead up to this, and you've touched on it there, and I wanted to quote you. All right. The spoken language, as opposed to mathematical language, we use for quantum mechanics has never really been fully fixed. So we'll say things like light is both a particle and a wave, which is on its face a logical contradiction. The logical contradiction is in our language, and nature just goes about her business without any concern for us hurting ourselves in the confusion of words that don't quite fit reality. This is why a physicist asked to explain what, con what quantum mechanics is really about will often say a bunch of strange, sometimes contradictory stuff, and finally give up saying you just have to look at the math. Yeah, I mean, I feel that way sometimes, you know? Like, math is like learning a language. It's it's a lot more adaptable language than English or anything else we have. So you can use your math to describe any weird things that nature sh throws at you. You can kind of invent new meanings with math in ways that you can't with ordinary language. So our ordinary language is always trying to catch up, but learning the math to do all this stuff, it is like learning a language, and it's a really foreign language. What's your favorite equation? Oh, man. I wasn't prepared for that one. <sighs> favorite equation. Well, I guess if I'm sitting here, as a, as a scientist at the, at the Quantum Coherent Device Physics Group, I got to say the Schrodinger equation. Dude, that one came up. Mike Jordan, an AI expert we talked to, that's his favorite. Really? All What's right. so hot about Schrodinger's equation? And well, why does everyone talk about the cat and not about the equation? The, uh, the equation is kind of the first time when um, all these guys who we only have black and white photos of, we're, we're talking about how are we going to deal with these new 
kinds of physics coming up. And Schrodinger, uh, he was saying, this behaves like a wave. When somebody has said, look, if it behaves like a wave, it should follow a wave equation. And that's not the right wave equation. So he went off to a mountain resort, thought about that. That's where all the best thinking happens. Yeah, you know, at the time, it really helped to have be money and privilege if you're going to be a physicist. Yeah, it seems it, like that helps in a lot it of helps, It helps you do anything, honestly. Yeah, the arts aren't very different. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thanks, Mom and Dad. It's, uh, it's less true now, which is nice. But anyway, Schrodinger went down. He wrote down what is now known as the Schrodinger equation and said, look, here's the equation that describes how an electron moves, and it looks like a wave equation. And it even took time after then to, to kind of interpret the right way to use it, but he was the first guy who wrote it down, and, and that gets his name. So like in Schroeder's equation, isn't there some accounting for like the observer's role in what's happening to the particle or the wave? Like it's ultimately in the eye of the beholder, whether it's either, and there's actually truth in both? You know, I hear that a lot, especially when I was first learning quantum mechanics. And so there was this idea of observation, and maybe a person has to see it or something like that. I think that's BS. It's still a real interesting question. Is how does how does how does a quantum measurement end up looking classical? It's important to remember that there really is no transition between quantum and classical. Everything at its, at its root is quantum mechanics happening all the time. You and me having this interview, it's all quantum mechanics happening. Are the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics that unpredictability is built into like nature's hardwiring? Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that I find... That's fucking insane. Yeah, it's great. I mean, before quantum mechanics, there's this idea of, like, the clockwork universe. But yeah, everything's be deterministic, right. everything's just running. Maybe we can't see all the gears, but everything is set and all the gears are moving. Quantum mechanics, we get down to the lowest, the, the most basic level of nature, and we say, like, oh, sometimes stuff just happens. <laughs> and you know what the other problem is? Yeah. Like, physicists use ordinary words to mean specific things. And I'll start switching in between the general English use and the physics use without even noticing it. Right. It's interchangeable for you. Uh, yeah. For me, I go back and forth. And your brain's and, running. And you're and thinking about all know. this stuff. Yeah. So you're just trying to get the information out as quickly and succinctly as possible. But it's like there's going to be some hiccups along the way with that. Yeah. And this is why it takes years and years and years of study and practice to Well, that's what made Einstein stuff. so yeah. special too, right? It's not just the discoveries, but the explanation of the discoveries. Yeah, I mean, so much of physics, it's not like, oh, I discovered a thing, like I uncovered a treasure. A lot of times there's data already there, and you're like, I have a new way of thinking about this. It's knowing how to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, because that was like, I always bring this up, but like Jolie Curie, like they discovered neutrons, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't know what a neutron was, so they thought it was a mistake in their yeah. data. Yeah. But they're sitting on like a Nobel Prize, and they're just like, they don't have the requisite yeah. knowledge to like shout it out. Like in grade school, they'll tell you something like, here's the scientific method. You observe something, you make a hypothesis, you test it. That's a cute little just so story, but it's not, it's like, I feel like that's a, that's a story that's easy to tell that doesn't match reality very well. Really? Yeah. The scientific um, method? The scientific isn't method the scientific is method? a just so story that uh, might have some use, but. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> Whose fault was that that it became like the story they told everybody? You know, that's a really interesting question in the history of uh, science and education. I don't know the answer to it. But someone but messed it's, up. It's so much messier than that, and I think it works better than that method could. What are the parts that are missing? A lot of times it's more like, hey, that's funny. I wonder what would happen if I tried this. You're not testing a hypothesis if you're just like, hey, let's just try something. It's just, I, I don't know what would happen, um, but that's a really important part, not just for discovery, but to making sure what you already have, what you already understand is right. If you assume that you have some, you know, a system that works. I'm, I'm talking to my qubits a particular way, and I've got a system that works, and I just assume it wouldn't work if I tried another method. Sometimes you just got to try that other method, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it'll, it'll, it'll work, you didn't think it would. Sometimes it'll break in a way you didn't think it would break, and it's like, that broke in a really funny way. That gives me an idea for something else. So it's just not so linear. There's branches that are coming off this thing. And That's they're right. bearing different fruit, but it doesn't mean it's all directional. Yeah, it's way more exploratory, a lot less directed. And a lot of it is, is uh, well, intuition in a sense. that you, Sometimes you get all these ideas that don't link together. And sometimes you have that shower moment. And you're like, oh, I wonder. And that's the point, maybe, where it's like, I have a hypothesis, I'm going to go test it. Being wrong, if something's wrong, you can be certain about it. If you're being right, Maybe you just haven't found out you're wrong yet. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah.
My brain is cooked today, brother. Yeah, you're busy. Cooked, dude. But this is saying that this, this wave function that we're generically calling psi is equal to zero minus one, the, the, the kind of zero state, tails if you will, minus one, the head state, and this one is multiplied by i, which is the square root of negative one. So there's like four forces, right? There's strong, weak, magnetic, and gravity. Yeah, electromagnetic, strong, weak, and gravity. Yeah. What's to, your favorite out of the four? Oh, it's easy, electromagnetism. I mean, sure. like I said, all chemistry, everything I think about, and everything gets, uh, you know, if, if there were no nuclear physics, if, if the atom was just like positive in the middle, who cares what's going on? It's just a little chunk, chunk of positive charge and mass. Uh, electromagnetism still work. Everything, everything I know and love would look the same. 